Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman, and I am your host. And my guest today is Jenny Allen. Jenny is a magazine writer, writing profiles of people in the arts, and more recently, humor pieces for The New Yorker. She is also a contributing editor to Good Housekeeping magazine, and has two essays in a new anthology, In the Fullness of Time, 32 Women on Life After 50. Jenny lives in Manhattan with her cartoonist husband, Jules Pfeiffer. She has two daughters, and she is also a survivor of ovarian cancer. She wrote and performs a one-woman show called I Got Sick, Then I Got Better. And she's here today to share her story and to actually do segments from her one-woman show. Welcome. Thank you, Natasha. I'm delighted to be here. And I am so thrilled you are here. I couldn't wait from the time I met you about a month ago. So I'm going to jump in from a variety of places. Please do. You know, I was thinking today that um, typically I ask the first question, whatever comes to mind. But I thought you've probably been asked the first question a hundred times and may be sick of the first question oh. on the subject. So I thought, what is your most favorite question to answer? Well, I'll tell you the one I, first let me say the one I get asked more fre most frequently, I guess, is how are you feeling right now? And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't going to ask no, you that. No, no, it's all right, but you know, people, <laughs> yes. I, it's good to kind of get out of the way, I yes. think. And at the moment, I, I've, I'm fortunately, fortunately the set has a lot of wood on it. Yes. So I will <laughs> knock upon it yes. many times. Um, I um, am just, ha I'm, you know, uh, as far as anyone can tell, cancer-free right now. I just had a PET scan, and um, my doctor called to tell me that all, all is well. Uh, it is, a, it is a, a greedy disease, and it likes to come back. So you, do, you don't take that huge sigh of relief after five years that perhaps you might with other cancers, although it, it is almost exactly five years. Wow. But it does, it does it's a very sneaky cancer and likes to return so you just but at the at the moment and for the last five years it is not I have I've been okay so which but, is great yeah you know uh, here's the thing um, you you have this diverse life and you play a lot of roles and you're creative and you're talented and you're a mother and mm. a wife and a writer and a performer mm. and someone who has survived ovarian cancer now what mm happens sometimes is that identity starts to overshadow all the other identities. Oh, Has that happened so interesting? For you? Um, I I took to heart my my directors. Uh, I had two directors, and uh, one was James Lapine, the uh, wonderful, renowned director, and the other, a slightly younger guy named Darren Katz, who was a wonderful director too. And their feeling was, as theater people, that this is a, th a theater piece that is um, that the theatricality of it or the existence of it as a play and a piece of theater trumps even um, the, ha um, the fact that the play can be helpful to others and can be a good kind of outreach. So. Um, and I agree with them as a as a performer. I, I think that they're right, but I have to say, I love doing it for people as an outreach gesture because they feed me. Um, the audience, whether or not they've had cancer, somebody they know has had cancer, yeah. and everybody identifies with something in the show, um, and and they f they give it back to me as I mm. do it, and it's more like a. It is a monologue, but it feels like a dialogue when I'm doing it because I wow. see their faces, and sometimes people just there's a couple of parts in there about a doctor and a, really an, an arrogant doctor, and I have great doctors now, but this woman doctor who you can hear people just go, "Ugh!" when I in the audience yeah. or of recognition or laughing of recognition, or sometimes people will talk to you from the audience and say, "Oh, I had that <laughs> I just I love that I love that isn't that great it's because great. it really means you're doing such a great job well, at communicating. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I mean, it fuels me so much. I don't, at first I was like <laughs> sort of taken aback, and then I realized the way we'd set up the show, the way the directors had planned, you know, had pushed for, 
the there's no what they call fourth wall between me and the audience. Yeah. So I, I actually appear to be, and I am speaking to them at many points in the show, and the fact that they're speaking back to me is, is just makes it a, w a wonderful both of us are it's a whatever you call that symbiotic relationship mm. but to really more directly answer your question um, uh, I am um, fortunately time goes on I mean this show consumed me now I enjoy doing it but I also have time a little bit now between just when I you know if I'm disciplined I have time to do um, humor pieces and other kinds mm -hmm. of pieces uh, because I don't think people want to hear from me forever about ovarian cancer either. I, um, I'm not sure you would want to do it forever either. Well, I'm either. not sure I would want to do it forever either. I think I do love doing it. I've done it at a couple of conventions, ovarian cancer things and for hospitals. I love doing it. I did it for some social work, a lot of social workers in and some doctors at Duke and that that is, was just a fantastic experience because they, these are people who, these were, you know, oncological social workers who, who deal with women all the time and they identify. It was like a, the, the party because they, they heard in some of the voices of the doctors or the wonderful nurses they, they heard their own experiences and they they always teach me a lot too. They wow. teach me, like I thought a lot of the things that I had described for example, a kind of sadness and malaise after I'd finished the chemotherapy, I thought that's so ungrateful of me. I was feeling worse after I finished my chemo and my treatments when they sent me home and said, you know, have a good life, hope we don't see you again. And I thought, I'm supposed to be feeling better now. And I felt so lonely and isolated. And they taught me at Duke, these social workers whom I talked to afterwards, the Q&A is fantastic too. They said this is a very common thing with women after they leave chemo, which is a very proactive state to be in. You're doing something about it, right? And yes. you're surrounded by all these wonderful nurses whose who's calling it is to, amazingly enough, to spend their days with women who are really sick and other women. You don't have to explain to anybody that you're sick. You don't have to say, you don't have to pretend to be better you don't have to worry about what anybody's going to ask you you're all in there together and you're doing something something is the, the doctors are doing something for you and then you go home and you're alone and you've got to start answering people's people they can't remember what you had what kind of cancer you had they want to know you have to answer a lot of questions and you're not around all this great supportive little community so I was fascinated when they told me that what I had described was very common. It has a name. Women come really. Yeah. How unusual! Because most of us would not think of that. I know. You'd I think didn't that, think of oh, it. Relief. Thank God. I never have Thank to be God, there I again. Go see that chemo suite again. Women actually um, find themselves going back to visit their chemo suites. Believe it or not, some of them. I, I could see doing it, except I live like 40 minutes from where I went. It, I don't. Right. I didn't miss it that much. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, there was a chemo suite, and the doctor I have now has a chemo suite that his wife runs, another oncologist, um, in his office, which is the coziest suite ever. And she is, and it's conveniently located in Manhattan. Women coming in all the time to see how she is and have a cookie, and they miss the camaraderie of it. Yeah, and I guess, you know, there were a couple of things you said about you don't have to pretend anything. Yes. And you're actually uh, doing uh, something about it. Yes. You have other people participating with you. And you know, I immediately, of course, as a life coach, what right. I immediately extract from that is, what if you could live your life like that all the time with Absolutely. nothing to pretend, like right. give yourself permission, nothing to pretend, right. Right. being in action around the things that are important Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. And, and creating a team. And people, being with people who yes. are totally, uh, you're, you're in the same absolute you're in the, all in the same boat and you're all doing something about yes. it yes uh, yes the, the, absolutely the, the 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 thing that's kind of wearing I mean I found when I was at home after my treatments and during my treatments right that there is this as you say not a good idea in life in general and it gets more exaggerated when you're sick this this discrepancy between 
the you that you have to pre you feel you have to present to the world and the you that's inside really frightened and hurting and and the discrepancy between discrepancy between these two people yes that's never good for us right as people <laughs> yes. we always have to have a yes. persona in public yes. but you have to get you feel that you have to get more protective or you feel I just remember walking down the street thinking, oh, there's somebody I really don't want to get into it. Oh, there's somebody I like, and they know <laughs> I'm sick, and um, I'll, I'll enjoy saying hi to them. Yeah. I, you know, but, but sometimes when you're sick, these, you're going between these two yes, people, and it, I could not, so that never get it. feels good. could so get it. And then sometimes you get ambushed, or you feel that you're ambushed. I didn't really come to this with enough inner strength, I, f I feel, but... One day, a woman I know, who, who I've, she's in my neighborhood. I've seen her for years. Our kids went to school together. And she, I, I never quite, she's always a little tricky. I'm never quite sure whether we're, whether she really wishes me well. or I, I'm not, I, I, so okay. our friendship didn't flourish, but we certainly see each other on the sidewalk. Right. And I was wearing a hat because I was having chemo, and I never wear hats because I just don't think I look very good in them. But I was wearing a hat that day. And she stopped and said, there is Jenny Allen in a hat. Well, 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 you are in a hat. That is quite a hat. Well, I've never seen you in a hat. Well, what do you know, Jenny Allen? And I thought, now is the moment. What I really want to say is, I could just, should I ruin her day? Should I just ruin her year and say, you know, I'm wearing a hat, Pam? It wasn't, that wasn't right. Her name. Um, because I had chemo? Because I'm having chemo. And I thought, that is the last time she's ever going to make me feel uncomfortable again. But I thought, of course, that's not fair of me. That would, that's a short-term solution. It would make me feel good right now. Right. But I, even I would feel bad for her. She doesn't know. She's just... See, you know so, what I hear is this yeah. whole... Not only are you uh, involved in social interactions as normally, but then there's this whole aspect of caretaking of other people. Oh my God! That yes. takes on a new, a whole new life. I know. I think it's just. I don't. But I th wanted to yeah. ask you. There is a piece in your show yeah. about you look good, or would you do that? For I us? would love to do it. It's a piece that people seem to like, and has to do with my over wildly sensitive, sensitive nature of what people say to you. When you have, am I, am I fa how am I doing in terms of how I'm facing? You're good. Okay. Um, and it, the piece goes something like this. I'm usually standing up, but I say, when everyone knows you have cancer, everyone feels compelled to say something, and nobody knows what to say. So everyone tells you how great you look all the time. For a while, I got told how great I looked every five minutes. Who can blame people? It's a nice thing to say. It's the first thing you say to when you run into someone you know with a terrible disease. I say it myself. And I preferred it to people gripping me and saying, how are you? Uh, now, some people were so vociferous about how great I looked. You look great! <laughs> I felt that they were trying to convince both of us that looking great might be some, some kind of sign that my illness would be transient. The reasoning seemed to be you simply cannot look this healthy and be so sick. Maybe you don't have real cancer. Maybe you're just cancer-ish, you know, and it'll pass, like the flu. Some people were uh, offered looking great as a kind of a booby prize. Well, you look great. Uh, and some people were, uh, were seemed uh, so taken aback um, uh, seemed taken aback the, by the fact that my illness hadn't ravaged my appearance. The, uh, the reasoning here seemed to be, uh, you don't look like a cadaver at all. <laughs> they would say, oh my God, you look great. Now the, the subtext here, you don't look like a cadaver, was, uh, was sometimes it, was, it wasn't even a subtext. Sometimes people were just right out in the open about it. I ran into a retired art history professor I know. You look great, he said. And I was dreading seeing you. 
Now, hardly anybody else tried to be refreshingly candid, although <laughs> I was at my friend's apartment when Rufus Wainwright, singer, mm. happened to come over one day. Oh, hello, Jenny, he said. Aren't you supposed to be dead? <laughs> that is true. Now, um, and what was your reaction? Well, I, I think I'm told by my friend who's th that he, I just stood there, and then he left, and I burst into tears. I didn't... It's not often that I just don't have, I'm at a loss for words. I was at a total loss for words. I just, I was just floored. And I, I eventually, and then he, he did, he's a very sweet guy, and he did apologize to me. And I thought, and I did say, that's fine, uh, but I have to tell you I put you in my show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was too late for, you know, beware of what you say to a writer, because it's all material. <laughs> anyway, let me, this little section finishes up with, I talk about Rufus, and then I say, people said, uh, it's so unfair. Hadn't, and I say, hadn't they heard of genocide, or tsunami, or Ted Bundy? People said, uh, you don't deserve this, like there was someone who did. People said, um, oh, people said, there's always somebody worse off than you. And I thought, how can you make yourself feel better about your own calamity by measuring it against somebody else's worse calamity? And what if you're the worse off person that people are thinking about? <laughs> oh, at least it's just a fibroid. At least I'm not Jenny Allen. And that would suck. People said, uh, what else did people say? People said, um, uh, there's always somebody worse off than you. People said, um, uh, you never get more than you can handle. Mm. And I thought, you know, that is just not true. But people get more than they can handle all the time. That's why people jump out of buildings. That's why people become Scientologists. <laughs> and then I talk about the one I hated the most. And the one I hated the most was when people said, everything happens for a reason. It seemed to me that many things happened for no reason at all, or more reasons than you can possibly ever tease apart. And anyway, when people said everything happens for a reason, what they mean is, what they meant is everything happens for a purpose. And I'm sorry, but I just don't believe in that kind of divine intervention. I think that life is amazing and thrilling and precious and a gift, but I, I don't necessarily think it has a point. Uh, and I should say here, I go on to say, I should say here how kind and generous so many people were, what loving things they said and did for me. People called me and they sent cards and some of my friends sent their favorite scarves for my head. <laughs> and a few of my friends even delivered dinners to me and wow. my family, I know, which is done all the time in most parts of the country but is just not part of Manhattan culture. Hmm. And then I, that section winds up with me saying, I wanted to keep people at arm's length because I didn't want them to feel sorry for me. But then, if they didn't ask how I was, or if they asked in a way that seemed to minimize my situation, like, oh, I meant to call you. Somebody told me last summer you were sick. I'd feel very slighted. And then I say, there really was no pleasing me. And that's the end of that section. That's great. Yeah. And you know what's great about it? It contains every aspect of our humanity. And so, you know, ultimately, is there any right thing to say? People ask me that. <clears throat> and I think I still must not be successful in the way I deliver this section because I try to say I do this myself. But I, I, I think I do come across as sort of saying, like, because I participate, I'm, I'm not sure there is a right thing to mm. say, because I do it myself. I say to anybody I know who's, I know going through a hard time, I say, well, you just are looking good. <laughs> um, and then unless really they have a big <laughs> gash on their face, I guess, because every woman likes to you hear that could every look person <laughs> likes to, yeah, you, could, you could look better, but, but I, I try not to lie, but, I, but people generally do look better than their illness. And when you have cancer, you, you, you don't necessarily look 
corpse-like-ish. Cancer-ish. <laughs> cancer-ish. You, you really don't. Yeah. In fact, I used to say I thought the chemo would kind of done, did something for my cheeks because I sort of have a little flush. <laughs> but I think one thing that I really loved and I still love so much was when people say to me, it, um, oh, my, my college roommate or my sister or my aunt or some, whatever, uh, they had ovarian cancer or they had uterine cancer and um, they are doing so great. Mm. Um, any story about people who've been really sick and have beat the odds or um, really are doing, doing well, I hung on to those stories. I, 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 my, I have a friend whose sister I didn't even meet till years later, but I, she had told me about her sister who'd had ovarian cancer you know, 20 years earlier. Right. And she was like a rock star to me. Sure. She didn't know it until I met her, and I said, you wouldn't believe how important you are to me. Yeah. Um, but that was really helpful, really helpful, those anecdotes. Um, I'm just going to yeah, interject please. here because the, the one area that I can sort of relate to is uh, you know, I have diabetes. Oh, you and do? And when I mention that to people, and I'm doing great, I've had it for 20 some right. odd years, and it's not an issue, and I don't think of myself as debilitated in right. any way, but for some reason, people feel compelled to immediately tell me about their relatives who died oh, this because is so of funny. diabetes. I, okay, this is, a, this is a, did a piece for Good Housekeeping when I put this in, by the way. I, you know, it's so interesting, Natasha, because I, they, uh, this was another reaction that I had, and I, I did put it in, a, in an essay I wrote. Um, it, I think people are so, well, I don't know why they do this, because my theory was that I think people are so shocked when you say ovarian cancer that they, that they instantly try, they want to do, say something helpful. So they'll say, oh, my cousin had ovarian cancer. And then, and, and, and she, she loved her doctor, and she loved this hospital, and, she, and you say, well, how's she doing? They say, well, she, she died. Yes. It's, uh, my theory was that they're so trying to be helpful and knee-jerky that they haven't thought the whole story through, that you could almost see it in their eyes like, oh, right, I shouldn't have brought her up. <laughs> because in their panicky yes. effort to, but diabetes is so common. Yes. And, it, and I don't even see panic. I don't, I don't, I've never quite figured it out. I'm totally it mystified. It is really funny. Maybe then I have to give up a, my theory about it's being about ovarian well, cancer. you know what? Maybe it's just that them so warning me to take care of myself. That's about the only explanation I can get. Uh, and you're a life coach, so I'm sure you've mined your, your head. Yes. What is this impulse in human nature that does this? But I guess you're, you know, maybe it's a kind of, don't, I like you. Please don't let happen to you what right. happened to them. Yeah, I, that was the I, best explanation I could come up with. But it's not, it's like, but still, would you ever in a million years? It's inevitable. <laughs> they immediately tell me about having limbs cut off. And, you know, I, I it mean, is just <laughs> weird. I don't, I, I don't, that I really don't know. I yeah. really don't know. Yeah. I, my, I used to joke with my friend who had ovarian cancer, who did die. She, I thought it was just me. My, my people I knew saying this, but she said it happened to her all the time, people telling her about people who had died with ovarian cancer. We used to laugh about it. Wow. But, you know. know, one of the things that I hear, uh, and, and this sort of sounds trite, but at the same time, uh, it's very profound, yeah. is this whole idea of being able to create humor out of it. So your story is, right is a all. story about something pretty frightening and pretty traumatic and all the implications mm -hmm. and how it affected uh, you know, you have daughters, and do they worry? Oh. And you know, uh, do you then? So there's a lot of uh, frightening pieces to it, and it would be very easy, I assume, to succumb to all of that. And yet, at the same and time, and I did succumb to all of that too. But sorry, go on. Yeah, and at the same time, to actually come out and uh, you know, being a writer, of course, right. to, to write a, a one-woman show that includes not only that piece, but right. includes the absolute humor of the human condition. Well, the humor, you know, humor, humor loves extremes, and when the stakes are very high, yes, and it, things get funnier the higher the stakes get. I yes. mean, every any joke that's set up with you know, you can live or you can die. And the guy says, well, I don't know, you give me five more minutes or whatever. It's, <laughs> it's funny right. already because right. it's not just, the stakes are so high that they lend themselves to 
humor if you have a funny turn of mind anyway yes. that that some of the things people say to you strike you even when you're shocked as funny or some of the things that happen to you strike you as funny or that the contrast is so is so ridiculous between um, living in sickness and living in health and the surprise just this bumps along the road and the kind of the some of the humiliations that you have to uh, of various exams and tests and and then the the medical community you you'll never lack for characters in the medical community <laughs> <laughs> you just woo um the but you know the unfeeling doctor the doctor who says something you cannot believe that they said it or oh, um what was the worst thing a doctor ever said to you oh my god let's see um well this wasn't the worst but let's see I, I was going to a new internist after my history i needed a new doctor um in part because um my internist hadn't picked up on i was sort of saying to him i have a lot of pains here for like a year and a half so I thought it was time to get in, and then when I called to tell him I had cancer, he never called back, and I was sort of one of his least troublesome patients, and I thought I was a nice person, but I thought I'd better get a new doctor. So I went shopping around just for an internist in case something else went wrong with me. And this woman sh looked at my chart, which I, you know, you spend an hour filling sure. it out, and the third line says, do you have any serious diseases? And I said, ovarian and endo endometrial cancer. And she, she was in a hurry, the way doctors often are, and she said, so it's very nice to meet you. Have you had any, uh, tell me, have you had any serious diseases? And I said, well, it's right there on the, you see where the third line is? And she looked down and she goes, oh my God, that's awful! <gasps> Just, <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of how I felt about it, but it's like, whew. But, the, but, but I did have, I did have a, can I just tell the story quickly? Do we have time? Oh, uh, we, enough. We, we don't have time in this segment, okay. but okay. you are going to come back for the another half oh, hour segment. Oh, I can't wait because I have more so anecdotes and nice anecdotes about doctors, But too, I did but, want to yeah. mention that yeah. you were one of the people uh, who were uh, received an award from the Gilda oh, Radner. Oh, you're sweet. I did get this wonderful award a couple of weeks ago. Gilda's Club, which is a national but based in New York organization, founded in memory of Gilda Radner, who died of ovarian cancer. Um, it, is, it is a wonderful, um, it provides support for cancer patients and their families and their kids. And it's, it's headquartered in, in Manhattan. It has outreach other places. Right. And they give an award every year to two women. One of them is a do-good award for some, somebody who's raised money for cancer or done good deeds. And the other one is for a performer that's in honor of Gilda Radner since she was a performer, a performer who's doing something with cancer in it. And uh, and you were it. And I got and I won that How award. How great! How and great. I know it was thrilling. And there was a big lunch at the plaza. I know. And I, I got to make it. a speech. That's wonderful. And I got my picture taken, and it was it was great. So even when you ask about does this take over your life, it doesn't take over. But I I do love the. I do think the recognition is, it's, it's nice for me, but it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's nice that this, that, it's a way of getting people aware of it, and yeah. it has a great ripple effect that way. You know what? Uh, and this is uh, we have thirty seconds yeah. left before we complete this segment. But <laughs> I think that what I hear is that it's not a consuming process it's an engaging process for you it's a wonderful way to put it it's really engaging it's really rewarding yeah um, and we're going to stop now right. okay thank you for joining us please join us for another half hour with jenny allen my name is natasha sherman